Um, my name is Bauman Bakhtiari. I am the executive director of the Basketball Institute in Salt Lake City, Utah. Our institute is committed to exploring the longstanding uh, friendship relationship between Americans and Iranians that started with Howard Baskerville in 1908. So we are delighted to have this program today about Louis Fuchs, another remarkable American who went to Iran and helped discover and preserve the Caspian horse. Uh, Louis Fuchs brought Caspian horse to the world's attention. At the same time, she also brought to the world's attention the friendship she cultivated with the Iranian people. So we are very fortunate to have today Atisha Firuz, her daughter, and Ambassador John Limbert, who will be moderating this panel for us. We also have a short video, 10 minutes video, that will start before Atisha's presentation about the life of Louis Firuz. And you will see some of the pictures and videos of her in Iran. So Ambassador Limbert, we are really delighted that you could join us. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bakhtiari. It's a true pleasure uh, to be part of this program today. I wanna to thank the Baskerville Institute and everyone who has put this together. Uh, so, again, I, I, it's a special pleasure for me because um, I have personal connections to the Firuz, fa to the Firuz family, to, um, uh, to Atishé's uh, wonderful uncles, uh, the late John Leyland, who was mar actually married to a Foreign Service colleague, Barbara Schell. Um, and then, to, uh, although I did not know her mother, uh, her mother, I felt, I feel like I did, because uh, I, I knew her late brother, John, and then I also still know uh, her late, her brother, uh, David, who, who has uh, always shares his wonderful insights on Iran with, uh, with me. Well, you can uh, uh, read Ms. F uh, Firuz, uh, Firuz's biography, um, and I hope you'll read her mother's amazing story uh, in this book, uh, Riding Through Revolution. Uh, Riding Through Revolution. I mean, it's fa it's fascinating. Briefly, um, Louise uh, Louise Firuz, or Louise Leyland, as she was, uh, came to Iran in the 1950s. Uh, and like many others, uh, caught a, an incurable virus known as the Iran bug. Uh, it has affected many. It has affected many, as we know, uh, um, as, as we all know. Uh, there, she met, she married uh, Narsi Firuz and raised a family and, and made an extraordinary life there for over fifty years. Um, interestingly, on her father's side. Uh, Ms. Atshe Firuz it has a, also a fa fascinating background. She's the great granddaughter of the amazing Rajar Prince Farman Farman, uh, de a descendant of Abbas Mirza, of uh, Crown Prince Abbas Mirza, and a person who cr uh, created much of Iran's 20th century intelligentsia uh, in the Firuz and Farman Farmayan families. I would also note today in the list of participants, and I hope that he is here, is we have Mr. Javad Dehan of Iran's uh, Caspian Horse Society. Uh, Caspian Horse Society. There is a lot of there is a lot of interest here. Now, time is short. Time is short. Uh, there's a lot of amazing ground to uh, 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 ground to cover. Uh, so I will just say. We'll now go into the presentation, but when we are when we are done, uh, if you would like to participate, you can uh, send in your questions through the question the question answer function at the bottom of the screen uh, at the bottom of the screen or through the chat fun through the chat function at the bottom of the screen. If you'd like to ask your questions live on sc uh, on screen, you can use the raise hand. Uh, function. I would only ask, as we always do, uh, that you, when if you do ask your live question, you ask it. Uh, you be can you be brief uh, in order to give our other uh, give Ms. Firuz and others uh, the cur the courtesy of the time to participate. 
So with, uh, uh, with that brief introduction, I turn the meeting over to uh, Ms. Atashe Larson Firuz, please. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Atashe Firuz, and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who's attending. We would like to start with the video first, Atashe, okay. and then All right. after the completion of the video, you can start your fantastic okay. presentation so we're going to okay. wait so let's start the video for the audience right now <clears throat> If you can just, um, just give me your name, actually. My name is Louise Firouz. Mm -hmm. and, and where are we now? We're in uh, Paratapa Sheikh on the Turkmen Steps in the northeastern part of Iran, right near the border with Turkmenistan. And this is really the, the heart of horse country. For Iran, it is, yes, the heart of horse country. I think the horse uh, has always been used here and bred here, and some of, well, probably Iran's finest horses come from here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> فریدون رو ببینم فامیل حسین علا ببینم بعد اون موقع آشنا شدم به نرسی فیروز که رفت شیراز اینو دیدم و من هم خیلی علاقمند به تمام این منطقه شدم بعد که آمدم اینجا فهمیدم که ایران چه عصف خوبی داره آمدم اینجا دیدم که واقعا عصف ایران عجیب قریب دیگه I did move up here 20 years ago for a variety of different reasons, but and set up this stud farm with my husband, late husband. But first we raised mainly Caspian ponies, and then um, we started raising these purebred turquoise. <laughs> It's a horse culture area, certainly historically. Do you ever look out over the mountains and think, well, it's time to go out, time to get on the horse and... Uh... Oh, the thought has occurred to me, actually, on a couple of different occasions and then every time it does and I look around the world I've decided that I'm in the best place anyway. And it's a great place for doing riding expeditions. Oh it would be fantastic. That, that, that's right it's the horses that have really always captured my imagination in Iran although Iran itself is such a fantastically beautiful country. It's, I was actually looking for some ponies for my children when I ran across um, these little horses up on the Caspian Sea and uh, we my husband and I bought a couple of them and um, the children started to ride them and then we started to wonder well where did they come from? It was what, what originally got me really interested in the history and the, the whole area of Iran, the Middle East, was the horses. And it was the research into the horses that then pulled me up with the ancient civilizations, the, the Scythians, the Achaemenians, the Parthians, because they, they dealt with exactly the same horses that we're dealing with today. In fact, in, during the time of the Parthians, I'm told that the main race horses in Sparta came from this area. And for sure, Alexander uh, may have killed off the people, but he certainly took their horses, and uh, I'm sure Chinese Khan did the same. So the horses went east to China and up to Mongolia and west into to Europe. Europe. Right. Mm. right. There's even a suggestion that Bucephalus, Alexander's horse, was perhaps from here, or certainly descended from a uh, Turkoman horse. Oh, it's, it's possible. Uh, they had such a good reputation that I imagine that Alexander would only have been satisfied with the best. 
The Oriental Horse was uh, developed, uh, well, the, what you know as the Oriental Horse really is probably the Arab and the types of horses that you find in the Arab countries. That was developed as a result of a crossing of the native uh, pony of the Zagros, now we call it the Caspian, and the Turkoman Horse, which is um, a breed that embraces the Yamut and the Guklan and the Ahal Teke uh, together. There's been a lot of work done um, with chromosome uh, typing, with, with DNA typing. There has, by Dr. Gus Cawthon at the University of Kentucky. We've sent him blood from all of the various different breeds of horses in Iran, and he's compared them with blood he's taken from Europe and the United States. And his conclusion is that um, the same conclusion we reached working on bones from archaeological sites, that um, the most ancient forms of uh, the oriental horse are the Turkoman and the Caspian pony. So it's quite conti uh, contentious what you're saying because for, for centuries people said the Arab is a breed. Some people suggested the Arab was a species completely separate from other horses. Mm -hmm. And this is wrong. That's wrong, no. It, it's an uh, uh, equus cavalus. It has 64 chromosomes. The problem is that I frankly don't think there ever was anything called the Arab. I think it was a group of, uh, of strains because it's an awfully large geographical area to have all the same breed. So it was the Koilan and the Hamdani and the Seklavi. I don't know all the various different types. But the, the Arab has been developed by Westerners who took them abroad and bred them without reference to their individual strains the way the Arabs bred them. And so they called it the Arab. I don't think the Arabs call it the Arab. And in fact, Iran is not called the Arab either. It's called the Asil, which means purebred. We, we actually, we know exactly what this horse is now. But as I said, it, it, it took 40 years um, of study to identify these original types of oriental horse. So she's a fossil. Really. She's a, well, yes, and uh, in who fact, you rediscovered. Uh, yes. Well, I was going to say, have you come head to head fist fighting with the uh, Arab Horse Society and Arab enthusiasts in, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, for instance? Yes. No. No, no, I haven't. Uh, I stay far away from politics of that sort. Uh, that's up to them. They, they can either accept this whole thing or not accept it, and if it doesn't suit them to not accept it, it's fine. But it's fact. And it's been borne out by archaeology, by um, biology, right? by oral history. It's and pretty much irrefutable. Ge genetics, it is irrefutable. I'm still finding out what it is, and I'm not so sure whether I'm saving anything or not. I think what I'm doing is having a good time. But in the meantime, also corresponding with a number of people abroad, like with people uh, like Bonnie Hendricks and Gus Cawthon, and slowly, slowly we've put together a picture of uh, what the horse was, what his genetic makeup is, and how the whole picture fits into the Oriental horse. So in effect, we have uh, solved the mystery of um, uh, whence the Arab. Well, in their own environment, they're capable of traveling great distances over a very uh, harsh country with no water because they have a very meatless body, and they're kept that way, sweated down with these felt blankets. Uh, abroad, and particularly with the Russians, they've been uh, capable of incredible feats of jumping and also dressage. So I, I suppose uh, taken to the West, they, they could be used for any one of the sports, whether it's endurance riding or uh, dressage or jumping. What, what are the defining qualities? What would you see in a typical horseman here and horse in the way of trappings and saddlery and so on and so forth? Well, first of all, you probably wouldn't even see the horse because he's covered with a felt. And second, ridden by a man, very seldom by women. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a woman on a horse here, although I'm sure they did in the old days. And the men wear sheep, uh, skin, hats, um, caracol, I guess it's called, isn't it? The, uh, the bridles are always snaffles, and the saddle is a small, high-candled, high-pommeled uh, saddle that's made by themselves. And what do you hope for the breed in the coming years, in the, in the next 10, 20 years? Well, I don't, first of all, I don't think I'm going to be around for another 10, 20 years, but I hope that um, they will become popular again in Iran so that there's a good market for them, so that more Turkmans will keep them. And personally, you know, this is a very satisfying thing to have done. Everybody always thinks in their lives that, oh, wow, well, I'd like to do something, make a little mark. I don't want to just be a passenger on this world. I want to have contributed something in my life. 
and uh, this is my contribution to sports. Apparently, it's uh, quoted in the Quran that if you, every grain of barley you feed to a horse is a step closer to heaven. Well, you should be very close at this point. I know, it's wonderful, I'm about to slip in. <laughs> We want to welcome you to our program today. We are so delighted and pleased that you made time to do this presentation for us. So with all due apologies for the delay, Atisha, go ahead with your presentation. Okay. So my name is Atisha Firuz. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everybody and thank you so much for your patience for all this technology problems we seem to be happening. So tonight I will be, I, I'm going to tell you about the life of Louise Firuz, Bonia Sarzamina As, or the Lady of the Land of Horses. And so far as possible, I'll try and do so in her words. Okay, it's not going to the next one. So there we are. Louise Elizabeth Leyland was born in Washington in 1933. She passed away in 2008 in the Turkoman steppes of Northern Iran. This is the story of her life. When she was six years old, her family moved to a small rural market town just outside of Washington, DC. They, brought her, they bought a rundown old pre-Civil War house with a traditional red barn. In those days, they would ride to school on horseback along forest trails. She would tell us, we found it hard to abandon the horses, so we instead we abandoned school, in school. On her way home from having spent the day swimming in the Potomac River with friends, they'd stop for a snack at Buck Warner's, the village store. Years later, we would do the same thing on the back of two Caspian ponies that were spending the summer in Virginia on their way to Bermuda. After her parents divorced, Louise and her mother moved to a small farm in New Hampshire. In the winter, the roads became impassable. So for transportation, Louise would harness up her little Morgan mare to a sleigh. That definitely left its mark on her, as she used to say, getting up in the dark each morning to hitch up the mare and drive the 10 miles to school has given me a lifelong aversion to rising in the dark. Louise enrolled at Cornell University's Agricultural College with a veterinary career in mind. The courses were difficult though, and she ended up defeated by physics, turning to the classics instead. She was also very interested in learning Arabic, so she decided to take a year off to go study at the American University of Beirut. Louise's father, John Leyland, was an international lawyer, and at the time he was involved in the case of Iran versus the Soviet Union argued in the United Nations after World War II. It was a long and complicated case, which gave the Iranian ambassador at the time, Ambassador Hossein Alo, ample time to become good friends with the Leyland family. 
his son Feridun and the Leyland children became, began a lifelong friendship. So when Feridun extended an invitation for Louise to go to Iran for a visit, she eagerly accepted. This is how she described it. I'd been fascinated by Feridun's tales of Persia. Everything that I'd heard about the Orient intrigued me, the horses, the bazaars, the palaces, and the bleak landscape. This is a picture of Ambassador Hossein Alo, and on his right is Narsi Firuz, who you'll meet in the next slide. Luis was met at the airport by Feridun, who took her to the family's garden in the north of Tehran. The Alos were hosting a dinner for her that evening. Narsi Firuz, a civil engineer working in Shiraz, was visiting Tehran and he was also invited. His brother Eskandar was married to Feridun's sister. Narsi and Luis were immediately drawn together. And before returning to Shiraz the following morning, Narsi invited Luis and Feridun for a visit and he organized a special boar hunt in dasht Arjan, the Valley of the Lions. That evening, looking over dasht Arjan, clear and bright in the moonlight, Narsi suggested they get married. Louise returned to Cornell to finish her studies before joining Narsi and Shiroz. At the time, he was working as the chief engineer at the Namazi Hospital. He bought 15,000 hectares in a valley to the south of Shiraz in an area called Siach. Siach means 30 frosts in Persian. They planted fruit trees and wheat and built a small house in a stable. They spent many hours on horseback riding through the plains and the surrounding valleys. They also bought a small farm near Shiraz, which they called Little Lou, and they started a chicken business. Louise was given a back black Boss city stallion as a wedding present, which she named Kyrie Eleza. Together with Narsi's beautiful Qashqai stallion, which you'll see on the right of this slide, called Albert, and a couple of mares they bought, they began breeding the horses. During, during those years in Shiraz, they came to know the Qashqai people very well accompanying them often on their migrations. Iran's nomadic Qashqai, which are part of the Turkic tribes from Central Asia who settled in Iran during the 11th and 12th centuries, have roamed the harsh deserts of the area for hundreds of years. Each year they travel on horseback with their flocks of sheep and goats from their, winter, from their summer highland pastures near Shiraz to the north, to their winter pastures on the lower and warmer lands near the Persian Gulf. The farm at Siach was eventually taken over by the army and Narsi and Louise decided to move the family to Tehran. By then they had three children, two daughters, Roshan and Atishe, and a son, Karen. And you can see their children never stopped them from going the migrations. They were just strapped to the back of a horse and went along with them. Narsi's father, Mohammed Hussein Mirza, gave them a property that had been in the family for some time. Nuruzabad, as it was called, was 140 hectares of barren land about a half an hour to the west of Tehran. Nuruz is the word for the word for verbal, for, sorry, for the vernal equinox in Persian and means new day. Abad in Persian means to develop or to cultivate. Louise's impression with the land was the actual opposite. She said, there was very little to recommend the situation. On all sides of us, empty rocket desert, empty rocky desert stretched to the trees of distant villages on the lower slopes of the Tochon Mountains of the Alborz Range. They rented a small house in Tehran close to the Führer's construction company and the Iran Swiss school where they entered their three children. For three years, they juggled their lives between Tehran and Norzabod where they were busy trying to develop the land. The climate was harsh, oscillating between sub-zero temperatures in the winter to scorching heat in the summer. They planted trees, lots of them, and added hummus to a soil which was absolutely devoid of organic matter. The children also began to ride and that's where they ran into trouble. 
because the spirited stallions they had were much too much for them and they couldn't handle them. So they decided to look for smaller, more suitable horses for them. Picture, do you see the horses in the, in the first stable they built in Norzoba? This is Norzoba a few years after they'd started um, developing it. So you can see the horse, the, the trees that they planted. At the time, the Arabian horse was very well known, but any information about the rest of the Middle East or Central Asia was virtually non-existent. There were no books that could shed any light at all on the equine diversity, which was all around Louise at the time. But she did remember seeing smaller horses grazing on the harvested rice paddies on a visit to, Cas to the Caspian the previous year. So with three friends, she set off with, in their Jeep to the Caspian. They ended up in the coastal town of Amul, where they abandoned the Jeep to have a look around. A young student who'd overheard them asking the locals if they knew of any small horses decided he was going to take charge. So he led them through the streets of Amul, through the traffic, through the uh, uh, donkeys pulling carts of wares, and through the different bazaars until finally they emerged into a courtyard where Louise said there was a wooden, there was a horse covered with cement dust attached to a crude wooden cart. He was about 11 hands tall, which is 110 centimeters more or less, slim with tiny ears and large bold eyes. He had fine legs and small hooves. He wasn't a fat shaggy pony. He was a beautiful horse. Needless to say, they bought the horse. She said, the small horse we now owned was puzzling. It was the size of a pony, but it definitely did not fit the description of a pony. It was a perfectly formed miniature horse. So there seemed to be more questions than answers at this point. The reputation of the traveling party was preceding them as the word of four foreign women in a Jeep looking for small horses started to spread. They met many people in many small villages on that first trip. People in Iran are extremely hospitable, so many a cup of tea was sipped in huts like the one you see in the, in the slide that were, are beautifully adorned in hand-embroidered material from Giron and Mazandaran. There'd always be a samovar gently simmering in one corner or another. They were having tea on the porch of one such hut when a horse dealer they'd picked up along the way entered the yard, leading a little chestnut stallion. He was another perfect specimen of a miniature horse. Mama Dali, the horse dealer that seemed to have adopted them, was puzzled why sometimes they would say yes to a horse and sometimes they'd say no, even though the horses seemed to be the same size. But Luis had to admit that they couldn't really explain the difference either. But what they did know that was that they were interested in the small, slim, and fine-boned horses, while the ones that were resembled shaggy Mongol polis had no particular distinction. Having spent a number of days trudging through the mud looking for ponies, they decided they needed a change of scenery. They'd heard that somewhere to the east of the Caspian was an area known as the Turkoman Steppes. Horse people in, in Tehran spoke of these Turkmans and their horses with awe. So they abandoned Mamad Ali in search of the Turkmans. He promised that he'd take care of the ponies that were being kept in the, in the caravansaray. They reached the Turkoman town of Gorgon sometime in the late afternoon. The Turkoman steps is very different from Gilan and Mazandaran. You'll see men wandering down the streets with these big astrakhan hats and the women that wear these large tunics of red, mostly red with very flowery and colorful scarves. No. Many years later, Narsi and Louise would buy land and settle far off on the Turkoman steppe and grow to know the Turkoman people very well. So just so I don't lose you along the way, I thought I'd show you these two maps. The one on the left is of Iran and shows the location of all the places I'm talking about in the presentation. With Shiraz in the south, Nurzabad just to the south of Tehran, Kordan, just to the uh, west of, Te of Tehran. Amul and Babol are two cities on the eastern part of the Caspian Sea, or the easternmost part. 
and the Turkoman steppes, which is in, is in the northeast part of Iran. I also wanted to show you a map of the size, a comparative size map of Iran and the USA, just to give you an idea of the country and the kind of distances we're talking about. So after spending a few days in the market town of Pahlavidej, the four intrepid women returned to Bogor. They were supposed to meet their truck driver in the caravansaray where the two ponies were being stabled, but on the way decided to stop in a, in a small hamlet near Babol, and they found a, small, a little mare almost immediately. Louise describes her. She was beautiful but thin and covered with parasites. She was a little bay mare and we called her Ola Moro. Her place in the history of Caspian horses glitters because not only is she the first foundation mare, she was also the dam of Montoze Mahal, who was eventually given to His Royal Highness Prince Philip and lived for a while at Windsor Castle. So Ola Mora is the mare pictured in the middle of the slide. And to the right is Montoze Mahal, the, the uh, mare that was given to uh, His Royal Highness Prince Philip. And on the left is a little Caspian stallion called Osiman, who you're about to meet. Louise's curiosity and interest regarding the origin of the domesticated horse led her to contact many scientists all around the world to help her understand the nature of this little horse she now owned. She theorized that although the Sumerians and Achaemenians must have selectively bred the small horses in addition to catching them wild in the Zagros mountains, I doubt anyone had consciously bred these horses since the Medes. The ponies were an instant success amongst the children, but it quickly became evident that they would soon need more. So a short time later, Louise packed her two daughters into the same Jeep and set off for the Caspian. Halfway between Amul and Babul, we stopped beside a hut on the side of a small muddy road. A man emerged and we asked him if he had any small horses. He disappeared behind a pile of manure and soon returned with a tiny gray skeleton of a stallion. The most prominent feature of this emaciated creature was an abundant mane that obscured his eyes and face. We called him Osimon, who was the stallion in the previous slide, and he's also the one in the bottom middle and the top left. On our way back to Bobol, we spotted a little bay horse pulling a crude wooden cart with amazing speed. He was a brief vision of elegance before he disappeared down an alley of the bazaar. After parking the car and setting off in pursuit, dodging donkeys staggering under their ways, past the usual spice bazaar, copper bazaar, etc., they were almost out of breath when they rounded the corner, and there he was, standing beside a merchant's stall. Louise approached the man standing beside him and asked him if he'd be willing to sell the horse. She received an emphatic nap. To her dismayed look, he replied that in the 15 years he'd been working in the bazaar, he'd never owned a horse like that. But fortunately, the urge to bargain triumphed over sentiment or reason, and we were soon negotiating, Louise said. The owner of the horse had many good points, but the most irrefutable was that he could not leave his cart full of materials without a way to move it. At that point, another horse appeared around the corner and we bought it and handed it over to the owner of the bay. A further cash exchange and we owned Ostad, or the professor. Ostad is pictured at the bottom on the right and the top in the middle. And indeed, he lived up to his reputation of a horse that he hadn't, we hadn't seen in the previous 15 years. By 1965, so three years after moving to Norzabod, breeding of the Caspian horses had begun in earnest. The stallions were used as children's ponies and the mares went into the breeding program. And the farm was becoming fast all bought. The Yahuti grapes and asparagus that had been planted in the first couple of years were fetching premium prices at the market. And the horses were delighting in the pastures of bluegrass and clover that had been that was covering most of the farm at the time. 
There weren't many competitive equestrian sporting activities, so Louise and, Lar and Narcy reluctantly filled the void. They organized many equestrian events, such as steeplechases, hunts, paper chases, show jumping events, three-day events, and much more. In the meantime, Louise became involved in the establishment of the Royal Horse Society, which was set up to recognize and register Iran's unique range of native horses. Louise and Narsi also established the Pony Club in the Farahabad, which were the royal stables at the time, and they set up the Jim Khanna Association. It was becoming very clear that the Caspian was indeed a, a, a breed of a horse. So Louise established a stud book with a foundation herd of horses that she'd collected and bred. By then, the small nucleus numbered five stallions and six mares. She embarked upon extensive research with scientists from all around the world. Eventually, evidence would prove that the Caspian was indeed an ancient breed predating all other horses in the region. Export started in 1966 with Johan, a beautiful little liver chestnut stallion that was shipped to Virginia to stand as stud. In 1971, three Caspians were shipped to Bermuda via Virginia, where they took part in competitions on the Virginia show circuit. Those were the ponies we rode to Buck Warner's, the village store. They were followed by several different shipments to the UK and the setting up of the International Caspian Stud Book. Until the Caspians were sold to the Horse Society in 1974, they were able to breed the mare without crossing back to the same parental lines. That was vital as the very small numbers of breeding stock was always a constant worry. In 1971, His Royal Highness Prince Philip and Princess Anne were invited to visit the royal stables on their way to attend the festivities of the 2,500 year of royal dynasty. Three Caspians were presented to Prince Philip for inspection, and you can see them on, on the right picture on the slide. Louise said he made some astute comments about the wisdom of keeping such a rare herd all in the same place. I was happy to hear this, as I was hoping he would accept the gift of a mare and a stallion, having had similar misgivings myself. The Caspian Stud was founded during this time by Elizabeth, the Caspian Stud UK, sorry, was founded during this time by Elizabeth Hayden, now Webster, who had bought the Caspians that had been shipped to Bermuda in 1971. Liz is pictured in the, in the slide here on the left, holding the mare Horshit Kolo that was presented to Prince Philip. Liz worked with her mother Jaffa and Arthur Griffin and were well aware of the fact that for their venture to work, they needed to have new stock. So the Royal Horse Society gave permission for four more horses to be exported. Louise recalls, not for the first time, I was struck by the unqualified enthusiasm the British brought to all aspects of their lives and I was relieved that they were including Caspians. It's no exaggeration to say that the Caspian was saved as a result of their combined efforts. Without their recognition of the potential for the Caspian, we would have had little incentive to augment the pitifully small numbers in our herd. Financial difficulties, however, forced the sale of the herd of Caspians to the Royal Horse Society in 1974. This seemed to be an ideal solution to the problem of preserving them in Iran. It was a logical step, after all, as the Royal Horse Society was established to breed and preserve the native breeds of Iran. Furthermore, it had been agreed that Narsi and Louise would manage the herd and continue with the breeding program. In the end, Nodizabad was also included in the sale. And despite the agreement to stay on and manage the breeding of the Caspian for four years, they were given two weeks to vacate the premises. In Louise's words, this was a traumatic decision, requiring the closure of the riding school in mid-season and finding alternative stabling for approximately 100 horses and a home for ourselves, by the by. The 23 Caspians from the original breeding herd remained.
Despite having to move all those horses, herds of sheep, dogs, farm equipment, and children, Louise and Narsi found temporary homes in many different places, ranging from Zarindasht in Karaj to Ajin in, the, in, in Kurdistan, which is all the way to the west of Iran, and from there to the racetrack in Khalbushtare, just outside of Tehran. While at the racetrack one day, Luis came across an old acquaintance from the Turkmen steppes. He suggested they make the move to Karavol Khan, which is a place of grassy reaches and rocky ledges on top of a mountain overlooking the Turkmen steppes close to the village of Poche. Luis remembered the moment very clearly. She said, with or inordinate haste and not personally checking the site, I ordered the necessary trucks and shipped all but the stallions to Pache. The horses were unloaded and walked the remaining 11 kilometers to the top of the mountain. There was waste high grass and scattered trees and a limitless view over the Atrek River and the beginning of Central Asia. But so much vegetation must surely require considerable moisture at some time of the year and the Turkmans soon confirmed the ferocity of the elements. So it seemed that Al Khan was also a temporary solution. The answer to winter shelter came in the form of Karatapesheikh, a village down in the valley devoid of cultivation. This did not deter Louise. Her description is very relieving, revealing, sorry. Although I was somewhat skeptical about what we could accomplish with nine hectares of baked steppe, kilometers away from all, any all weather roads and near a river whose high banks suggested that it spewed forth more than muddy ooze, we returned to put the proposal to Narsi. Narsi was dubious, but, accept, but agreed to the project. There was no running water, no electricity, and the only existing road to the town of Kalale was across the muddy river. There was no bridge in sight. So they summed up the situation in these words. There's two there are two ingredients. Oh, sorry. Louis, so Louise and Narsi, before they summed up the, the situation, I have to tell you that they immediately began preparations for building a barn, which they designed. But they had to keep the cost down. And so they decided to use only local materials, which meant the ground on which they stood and the muddy water from the nearby river. They summed up the situation in these words. Those two ingredients mixed with straw from the previous harvest, and we were well into the construction business. August proceeded with a monotony of mud dumped upon mud, broken by trips to the nearby forest for huge oak logs, which we hauled to the sawmill in Goba de Kobus to be cut into posts and planks for the fence. With what seemed infinite slow motion, the walls of the barn crept upwards towards the sky and the fence post punctuated the level plane of the step. August drew to a close and September heralded the beginning of Ramazan. The construction of the barn came to a standstill. To compensate for the blistering dry summer, winter fell out of the sky with little warning from autumn. The barn was still lacking a roof, although the poplar rafters and bamboo were piled nearby, ready to be installed. So the Quatre which was the village chief, was told that they had an emergency on their hands. He immobilized the whole village, and in two days, the barn had a roof. On the right of the slide, you'll see the, the whole village standing proudly standing in front of the barn with a new roof. On the left in the slide, you can see Louise in front of her hut, which is a place she preferred to live. It was a one room hut with, which had a kitchen, bedroom and, and living area and what she liked in every room, a fireplace. After the sale of the Caspians to the Royal Horse Society, Louise and Narsi were left with a single Caspian, Osemon, a little gray stallion. So she find no reason to stop breeding Caspians and set off, to the, set off to the Caspian to see if she could find some mares. She returned with two plus a little stallion, which she rather aptly called Prince Caspian. In 1977, he graced the stage of the Rudaki Hall in the Sadler's Well Ballet.
oh, sorry, go back to that slide. So winters in GTS, which is Qarat Sheikh, where they were spent in GTS because there they grew barley for the horses to graze on. You can see that in the bottom left slide. But by Noruz, the horses were moved north towards the Atrek River. The winter there was milder and the grass grew luxuriantly green in the Khalid Nabi mountains. In early June though, when the grass ran out, the horses had to be moved up to the hills in Qarabol Khan. Louise describes those moves as, the migration to seasonal pastures was a nightmare of organization. The camp, cooking equipment, tents, ala sheikhs, all had to be transported to the new locations. Herding the horses from one location to the other was a pleasant, if tiring, occupation. By the spring of 1977, the second herd of Caspians numbered upwards of 20, but they were also joined by a nucleus of Turkoman horses that became a start of a new breeding program. By now their hands were really full, said Louise. Against this background of pastoral activity, we continued to work with the horses, paying particular attention to the seven Caspians, which Elizabeth Hayden and her partners in the UK wanted to import. So after once immersing themselves again in the formalities of trying to export seven horses, they finally boarded the Caledonian Airlines flight bound for the UK. Upon her return from the UK, Louise is informed that all existing Caspians in Iran are henceforth the property of the Royal Horse Society. This meant that the second herd of Caspians was to be nationalized and taken to the Royal Horse Society facilities. After that incident, Louise stayed on the steps, paying little attention to the growing dissent in the country, concentrating more on the harvest and raising horses. However, on the basis of, uh, on the advice of the Turkomans and some other locals, she, she decided that the situation was getting a bit serious. She said, those of us were, there were those of us who thought we could see the storm clouds of revolution looming on some distant horizon back in 1978. But for the most part, the revolution seemed to come as a surprise, even though all the ingredients were visibly there. A number of her books and research on the Caspians were shipped to England, and Louise went abroad for a few months. Upon her return, she was confronted by a spectacle of anarchy. In the ensuing chaos, the Caspian herd in Gombad was woefully neglected and finally auctioned off without the knowledge of the Firuz family. In September 1980, the Postar stormed the house in Tehran, that's the Revolutionary Guards. They blindfolded Louise and Narsi and took them away for interrogation. The interrogation lasted a few weeks. Louise's reaction was, well, this was one experience I could definitely do without. Upon their return from detention, life in Tehran on the hold seemed to return to the normal frenetic bustle of an oriental city. But this relative calm was short-lived. The American embassy was stormed and Iraq declared war on Iran. The country mobilized to protect itself. In a very understated way, Louis said, it was the arrival of the motor of a Scud missile through the roof of our house that persuaded me that I would rather not end my life in Tehran. So in an attempt to escape, escape the missiles, Louis and some friends discovered the little village of Cordon which was about 20 kilometers to the west of Karaj, so about 60 kilometers to the west of Tehran. They bought a small fruit garden, built a stable, and started the foundations of a house, in that order always. The Cordon River flowed near the farm, and on the other side were the foothills of the Alborz Mountains. There were apple, pear, and cherry trees, which were soon joined by some hens and a, ve and a vegetable garden. Coupons had been issued during the war and there was a scarcity of everything ranging from gas to kerosene to basic foodstuffs. So they bought a cow and started making cheese and butter. Although the bulk of the horses were kept in the Turkoman steppes, some of the riding horses were moved to Cordon and any remaining stalls in the stables were rented out to friends and other boarders.
During the wars, the Revolutionary Guards had amassed a large number of confiscated horses at their remount station near Varami, which is 50 kilometers to the south of Tehran. They contacted Louise and Narsi through a friend and asked if they would be interested in having some of the horses. But it gradually became clear that what they really wanted was a partnership. They'd heard about Caspian horses and their popularity in England. And I think that they envisioned large profits selling these horses abroad. They were kept in six enclosures, each containing approximately 300 horses. And although they seemed very well fed, they were completely wild. They were standing knee deep in a mixture of fine dust and dried manure. And we were supposed to pick out the likely looking Caspians, and then they were gonna send the soldier in to catch them. But the horses were not having any of it and snorted and stampeded as we approached them. And the dust they threw up was absolutely blinding and the heat was scorching. After each horse was selected, the soldiers were sent in with ropes to catch the unfortunate animal. They would gallop round and round until finally the horse was caught. After a few hours of this scorching heat and choking dust, we managed to leave with eight horses. Pictured here on the right are, are the horses arriving in Cordon, still with a lot of energy. There was a lot of work to do with these horses before we were able to even start handling them. And when the Revolutionary Guards realized the time and investment it would take to run the operation, they quickly lost interest. And Narcy and Louise were faced with the purchase of their half of the venture. The eight original had in the meantime been joined by a number of others in Cordon and were being worked by Louise along with some of the villagers The pony company was formed and the horses thrived. A permit for the export of seven horses was finally obtained after many hours of talking, negotiating, and finally using back channels and persuasion, plus the odd favor thrown in. At the time, the Caspians were starting to be exported to the USA, and it seemed like there was a lack of breeding stock in Europe. So uh, Louise attempted to, uh, to send these horses to the UK. But Iran's new status with the World Organization for Animal Health meant that the horses couldn't travel directly to the EU and would have to be quarantined in Belarus for six weeks. Six months later, the horses finally reached England. This is Louise working with the Caspians in Cordon. And you can see the beautiful Albors, uh, the snow cap. Albor's Mountains in the background. Unfortunately, Louise and Narcy were not, not able to recover the cost of the shipment, which left them with a large deficit they could ill afford. The remainder of the herd was moved to GTS where they could graze outside for most of the year. Soon after, they were bought by the Ministry of Jihad, a branch of the new government dealing with livestock. Then disaster struck. Narsi passed away in the spring of 1994. Louise continued to commute between the property in Cordon and Qaratapeche. It was a difficult commute, took about nine hours on very winding uh, mountain roads. She describes those days, the proceeds of the sale from breeding the Turkmen horses and the funds raising from keeping horses for friends were barely sufficient to keep me afloat, let alone buy fodder for the winter months. I had to find a new way to keep myself and my horses. It had been suggested to her that the amazing rides she organized on a regular basis could be extended to paying visitors. So she contacted a number of equestrian trekking organizations to establish a regular flow of interested visitors. Ruth Staines, who's the current registrar of the British Caspian Society, who went on five treks, describes Louise. I was privileged to ride with Louise on a number of occasions. She was a lady who inspired loyalty from horses, dogs, and humans. In a deeply patriarchal society, she was accepted and loved by the local Turkmen. 
Nothing seemed to faze her. Problems, of which there were many, were simply a part of life to be accepted and overcome. Above all, she was a master of the understatement. These uh, photos were kindly uh, provided by Bruce Danes, who took them from the back, or from, uh, for, from horseback there. You can see her horse's ears on both these two pictures. So what had once been the province of the Turkoman and the Plateau Persian horses was now being re replaced by the thoroughbreds and other horses that were imported from Australia and, New and England. And the race distances were now calculated to suit these new imports. And that put the Turkomans at a great disadvantage. And the focus of Iran's riding world in Tehran had also inadvertently switched from its own breeds to those produced by the West. The long-term effect of this program was the almost total disappearance of local breeds in Tehran's sporting scene. And for a country that had been providing the world with the best horses for over 3,000 years, this was a tragedy of major proportions. Louise, connect, Louise collected as many of these pure Turkomans as she could and earned herself a very special place in the heart of the Turkmens. She had been instrumental in helping preserve this breed, not only through her breeding program, but also because of the work she did with scientists in collecting and analyzing and comparing DNA samples. Here she's pictured with a horse that she raised and that, uh, that won a race in the, at the racetrack in Gomba de Kobus. Just so that you notice, there's no women in the in the um, in the grandstand. You rarely see a woman at these races. Luisa's herd of Turkomans is now considered the reference for the breed. This is an aerial view of the farm in 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 Sheikh on Turkoman steps, and the horses on the right and left are her are her foals. So I put this slide in, it's a timeline of the events that shaped Louise's life from the discovery of the Caspian horse in 1965 until her death in 2008. It, it's there to give you an idea of the number of tumultuous exper experiences that Louise faced each time rebounding to start again. So after the discovery, uh, eight years later, the nationalization of the original herd of Caspians and the sale of Norzabod, the farm, not very long later, they moved to the steppes. Three years later, they moved to the Turkoman steppes and they start their second herd, which is nationalized the following year. Then the following year, there's the revolution, the Islamic revolution. And the year after that, the Iran-Iraq war, which lasted eight years. They, they moved to Kordan and started the third herd in 1989, the Pony Company herd. And then, in 1993, the Pony Company herd is sold to the Jihad. In 1994, she collected a few uh, uh, Caspians because there were a number of people that were interested in importing them, but the, la the last GTS herd was smaller than the previous herds. She had an uncanny way of approaching every setback as an adventure and a challenge. She had a singular character and always seemed to start over with an unending optimism and belief in the success of each endeavor. As her lifelong friend, Brenda Dalton described her, Louise had a beguiling personality. She was charming, intelligent, and adventurous. She maintained a dignified elegance and composure, yet she was sociable and fun-loving. With a sharp wit and a ready sense of humor, she had an all-consuming love of horses, an independent spirit, and stubbornly refused to accept defeat. She inspired respect and, admir and admiration. Although she did not suffer fools gladly, she had a naive faith in human nature, often misplaced, which worked against her. When she discovered the little unique horse on the plains of the Caspian, she was welcomed with much skepticism. Nonetheless, she contacted archeologists, paleontologists, and geneticists 
in order to conduct research that would eventually vindicate her claim that the Caspian horse was the original oriental horse. After the revolution and the war with Iraq, most people were fleeing the country for the freedom of the West. But the magical pull of the oriental horse that she called her unicorn kept her in Iran. Louise spent the last years of her life leading trekking expeditions in the Turkoman steppes. Accompanied by two Turkoman grooms, whilst another drove the truck filled with tents and food, she'd often ride for eight to 10 hours at a time. At night, the horses were tethered and Louise and her guests would share the companionship of local visitors who were always delighted to welcome her and the traveling party. When Louise passed away in the spring of 2008, she was honored by the Turkomans with a Sunni ceremony and laid to rest by her hut amongst her horses and dogs and surrounded by the vastness of the Turkoman steps she loved so much. The Setari Golestan newspaper gave her the name Bonuya Sarzamina As, the Lady of the Land of Horses. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you so much, Adeshe. What a what a tremendous and moving so moving story. Um, those of you who have not uh, have not read the book have not read the book of her, uh, memory. Please, uh, I strongly recommend you do so and look again at the presentation. Uh, Bahman, I think we're going to post the uh, both the video and the. Uh, slideshow on the uh, uh, on the Baskerville website. Those of you who have questions, please put them either on the, you can put them on the chat if you like, I can see them from here, um, or you can put them into the question, the question and answer session, or you can raise your hand. Um, I'd like to start um, I understand. I, Mr. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Jabod uh, uh, Dehan was apparently not able to join us for the program of the of the Caspian Conservation Society from Iran, but he did send a message uh, to uh, a, a message of thanks to us. Um, also, uh, I believe we have in the audience uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Feriduna Ala. Um, who was mentioned early in the uh, early in the program, both him and his very distinguished father. So if uh, uh, Mr. Ala is in the audience, if you would uh, like to unmute your uh, microphone and join us and say a few say a few words um, about what we have what we have heard, please please do so. Are we there? Okay. So go ahead, John. Uh, I think if Dr. Allah will join, we will allow him to have the microphone anytime. So. All right. Very good. Anytime. Uh, uh, I would. Uh, I would like to start with one question, perhaps. Uh, did you t could you tell us a little bit about what the current status? Uh, of these remarkable horses are, and the status of what you know, what goes on from your uh, from your mother's amazing work. Um, I'm probably most uh, uh, familiar with the status of the Caspians in Iran because I work very closely with the gentleman you just mentioned, Jabal Dehran, and the Caspian Conservation Society. Um, they've done tremendous work since the the passing of my mother in 2008. They've been able to census all of the small Caspian-like horses, collect all of them, take DNA samples, and are in the process of eva eva evaluating or let's say assessing which one which ones are actual Caspians and which ones are not. It's a tremendous uh, amount of work, um, and um, they've been able to do that. They've been able to register them. The Caspian, the DNA samples are sent to Spain for analysis. So they've done a 
an, an incredible job. They've set up a society, they've registered horses, and they collaborate both with the Ministry of Jihad and the Equestrian Federation of Iran. So that's on the one hand. And then there are many uh, Caspians that are being bred throughout the world, in the US, in um, in Australia, I believe, in the UK, we've mentioned that many times. They're probably the epicenter of the, of the movement of Caspians out of Iran. Uh, but you'll find Caspians from Sweden to Norway to Hungary to to France, I believe uh, there there are people from France attending the presentation this evening as well. So, it's uh, for the small horse number of horses that still exist in the world. They're all over the place, and they've become very well known thanks to her work. We have a question from uh, a good colleague of mine uh, from the uh, from the U.S. Naval Academy, Professor Ernest Tucker who's asking about Cordon, uh, village of Cordon. And he says, is that the same place where uh, the Ottoman Empire and the Iran signed a peace treaty? Oh, I don't think so. Cordon is a, a well, it was a tiny village, literally a, um, a village of fruit trees until Louise moved there and brought her horses. And then she attracted other people and it became a horse village. It's no, now it's part of the, um, the megalopolis of Tehran Karaj, so it's indistinguishable from the rest of the little towns in the area, but it's probably one of the most inconsequential villages in Iran until it became the host of the Caspian horse. Oh, very good, very good. Uh, could you talk a little bit about sort of what it was like growing up with these, uh, with these magnificent, anim uh, magnificent animals? Um, well, you know, I don't want to disappoint you, John, but when we were growing up, they were horses, like any other horses. <laughs> so we were completely oblivious to their place in history or um, or the fact that they were special. What they did teach us was to ride well because they're like hot-blooded, they're hot-blooded little horses. So um, you learn to ride well, you learn to hang on tight, and especially when they're going over jump because they jump with a lot of energy and technique. So um but yes, no, it was, uh, we had a, we had a unique childhood. I, I see that Dr. Feridun Allah has raised his hand. So yes. please, uh, uh, would like to hear from you. Dr. Allah, would, would you like to let us to turn on your video, please, if you'll go ahead. Go ahead, we are, we have you on Dr. Allah. Oh, hello. Yes, uh, forgive my attire. I'm down with COVID. Oh. Uh, but uh, I was fascinated by this wonderful program. Lovely to meet you again, Artisha, after so many years. Uh, of course, it's very evocative, this program, because uh, I met the Leylands uh, uh, in 1946, uh, and uh, I went to school with David and John at Melton Academy. Uh, so I've known, I had known Louise for many, many years and uh, both in the United States and in Iran, and uh, uh, owed a great deal to her uh, lovely mother, Dorothy, who was so hospitable to me at Hancock in their farm that they had. Uh, in fact, it was I who introduced uh, Louise to Narsi Firuz as I was taking her around on a touristic trip through Iran. And uh, uh, I've always been fascinated by this amazing <laughs> Uh, a woman who uh, was so dogged in pursuing her dream. And uh, uh, I cannot say how much admiration I always had for Louise. And of course, Narsi uh, Firuz was a childhood friend of mine, as um, my brother-in-law, Eskandar Firuz, was as well. So it's wonderful. Thank you very much for this marvelous program and these beautiful pictures, which are so evocative. Thank you. Uh, we, there's a note in the chat. Uh, I believe uh, uh, that uh, David Leyland, uh, the sister of late, uh, the, the late uh, Louise Firuz is here. David, would you like to uh, say a few words, please? I don't see him right now. I saw him. I saw him earlier. But while waiting for this, Atishan, can I ask you a question too? 
Um, yes. You grew up in Iran or on the farm, right? Yes, yes. And could you tell us a little bit of your memories of growing up on the farm? And you told me in other sessions how much you were impressed by the hospitality of people around you. And there is an Iranian filmmaker who's made a film of the farm. And we're going to start working on that to show people the film that Iranian filmmaker has made of, of Louis Firu's farm. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience growing up on the farm? Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up as an Iranian, so um, and and I always found I've always found the Iranian people probably the most hospitable people in the world. Not that I'm biased or anything, but um, uh, we grew up, uh, you know, as as children on a farm, do riding horses, raising chickens, going. Uh, you know, our games were centered around horses. So if we played hide and seek, it was on horseback. If we did something on the weekends, it was generally on horseback. Um, uh, we lived out in the middle of nowhere. And so on during vacations, people would come to join us. So during vacations in Norzabad was like a, a children's summer camp, which was a wonderful way to grow up. Um, later on, when I went back to Iran after having lived abroad and studied abroad, um, I spent a lot of time in the Turkoman steppes as well. And indeed, people uh, were so um, welcoming to, to Louise, considered her not only uh, one of them, but had an incredible respect and admiration for her. And her memory is, is revered to this day. There's a, uh, her a uh, gravesite has become a sort of um, a pilgrimage uh, route for uh, touristic buses coming from Gombad and Pahlavi Desh. So it's a, um, I can only say that her status as, as an American in Iran was never, ever a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had a question, I have a, have a question here from um, Mani Ardalan Farhadi. Uh, she says, I am uh, Mani Ardalan Faradi, daughter of architect Nader Ardalan uh, and author Lali Bakhtiar. We knew your family, visited the Firuz farm. I was classmates with uh, Karen at Iran Zamin. My father said the Firuzes were an important contributor to Pardisan, an environmental park that would have been created in Iran to reflect the geographic regions. Do you recall? their input on Pardisan and deep, uh, I have deep respect for the Firuz family. Well, thank you very much for, for, uh, for your comment. And indeed, I recognize your name, although you're in my brother's class, not mine. But um, if there was a contribution, it was probably from Eskandar Firuz, my uncle, who, um, who in, in, in his own right is a, uh, is a monument in Iran to the environmental cause. So I think it was probably uh, more on his side. I don't recall that uh, my parents were involved in that project at all, but it might also be because I was, um, as a child, you're probably not aware of things like that. Okay, I am looking for raised, I understand we have some raised hands and I am looking for them. Uh, here they are. Wait a minute. Okay, I see. Ah, yes. Uh, there are two, there are two raised uh, there are two raised hands noted from the Baskerville Institute. Uh, so we will go the honor system, and one of the one of the Baskerville Institute raised hands could speak, and then the other could speak. Please go ahead, and please unmute yourself. Go ahead, you can ask your question. John, this is David Leyland. Can you hear me? Greetings. I, I just wanted to make a small contribution. It's been a tremendous and emotional experience for me to, to, to watch this and hear this. I was in Iran for 15 years up to the revolution and spent much of my time at Nodozabad when I was not involved in my own activities. And uh, 
this has just been a wonderful experience and I'd like to thank all of you, especially Atashe and you and, and the Baskerville group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you, have, do you have any particular uh, uh, memories you'd like to share with us? There, there are too many, John. <laughs> there, there are too many. I mean, 15 years is a long time. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I see another hand raised also from the Baskerville Institute. Uh, so please unmute yourself and uh, ident identify yourself and I'd like to hear your question. I think you're mute on a mute. Okay, it's coming. Go ahead. Still muted, apparently. Well. <clears throat> While we're waiting, I, I'd like to ask you, how to, um, this Caspian Conservation Society, uh, what do they do? What are they do? Can you tell us what they're doing? Um, so there, it's the uh, it's the breed society of the Caspian horse in Iran. And uh, you have to uh, realize that since 2008, no Caspian horses were registered in Iran. And the ones that had been previously registered, which were some of them property of the government, some of them property of individual people. Uh, they had continued to be bred, but without any registration or record of, of, of these horses. So in terms of, of, of a breed, it's a disaster. And so what the Caspian Conservation Society has done is what most breed societies do is provide registration for um, for the actual breed, but they also have had to go back and census horses, try to um, identify those that had previously been registered, but just were there were no records of them. So they've had to do some forensic work as well as the all of the duties of a normal breed society. So they have a tremendous amount of work on their hand. They're a, a group of young people, which are they are very well educated, very well up to what's going on in the equestrian world and what a what a function of a breed society is, but they run on very low funds. Usually, they run out of their living rooms or um, a borrowed room here and there. So, um, I have tremendous um, respect for the work that they've done up to up to now, and it's the first time in Iran we've actually had a functioning breed society, which so there's uh, a, a a lot of um, a lot of respect from that point of view as well. Mm -hmm. What was the status of the horse of the Caspian horse? Do we do we know before sort of your your mother's adventures? Well, you know the Caspian horse up in the region. What do we know about yeah. it? Well, actually, nothing because it's not it's not it wasn't a recognized breed. It was it co-mingled coexisted in in the mountains and plains of the Caspian and. In, in the Caspian area, there's no real culture of, of breeding horses like there is, like with the, the tribal areas or the Kurds where they have, they take pride, the horse breeding the horses and, um, and raising horses is part of their culture. Whereas in the Caspian area, their work, their horses of beast, their beasts of labor, sorry. So these Caspians just existed amongst the other breed of the area, which is called the Talishi. And it's a more coarse horse, uh, more like the Mongolian pony types that uh, that Louise was was describing. But um, uh, so so people didn't even know it was an actual breed. Not I mean this 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 horse has managed to coexist and or or survive because of a certain amount of geographical isolation. Number one, but number two, and more importantly, because it's able to live in the wild on the pastures of the Caspian plains and the mountains. But it was was it native also to the Turkoman region, or was it further west in the more toward uh, where they found it around Amol and Babol? The, it was the, the 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 it's native nowadays and probably in the in the in the past and um, centuries 
to the to the Caspian plains and the and the mountains because that's where the pastures are. Basically, if you look at fossil remains of Iran and fossil remains of equid remains of, in Iran, you'll see that they're all dotted. All the archaeological sites are dotted amongst the the mountain ranges where they're where they're pastures simply. And so in the Caspian, probably in you know millennia ago, was more down towards the Zagros Mountains and was used. If you look at the uh, bas relief in per Persepolis, you'll see evidence of a small horse that resembles the Caspian, which is what first started Louise on her research into the actual um, origin of this horse. So uh, they probably existed more towards the Zagros, more towards the southern part of Iran, but now were isolated. Now are isolated in the Caspian area. Hence the name. Thank you. We have a question uh, from uh, uh, I believe it's Professor Doug Anchak. Uh, Hello, Doug. And he says, uh, the question is, what were the political issues that led to nationalization of the Caspian herds prior to the revolution? Uh, well, very good evening to you, Doug, and I'm very um, um, happy to see you amongst us this evening. Um, I think the political issues are more to do with the fact that a horse was discovered that was potentially a national treasure, that was potentially also a source of great wealth, you know, if you, if, you know, some people probably had the idea that because of its uh, unique status was worth a lot. So all of those would lead to the possible nationalization on the basis of it, the, its national status, I would imagine. Very good. Bahman, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Yes, I wanted to uh, also ask you about, um, there has been stamps printed in Iran in honor of your mother. Uh, I think, did they publish those stamps during a conference about her? Has there been any conferences in Iran on the Caspian yeah. horse with a focus on the contributions of your mom? Yeah, so in, in uh, 2015, uh, we had, uh, there was a, the fourth international conference of the Caspian horse. And uh, that was a major conference with uh, panelists from all over the world, including Doug Anzac, Professor Doug Anzac from the University of Cornell, who gave a wonderful talk about, um, about horses. And that was the only uh, conference they had on the Caspian horse in Iran. Uh, since then, and you mentioned the, the, um, the stamps, they were actually, it was a, a joint project of the Caspian Conservation Society and the post office. And they made those, they came out with a series of stamps honoring the memory of Louise Fears and the work and her contribution to the Caspian horse. But, you know, we talk about the Caspian horse, but her contribution to the Turkoman horse was equally important from a, uh, from a genetics and a, and a conservation point of view. It's just w less well known outside of Iran. Uh, we have a question from uh, fr from one of our uh, participants, Mr. Siamak uh, uh, Abul Hassani. So please unmute yourself and uh, please put your, and and, and uh, raise your question. Uh, hello, Atisha. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I am can. I on mute? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the fascinating presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks heaps, and thank you, Institute, for arranging it. Uh, I had a question about the time that Louise, your mother, uh, chose the foundation uh, horses, foundation Caspian horses. Uh, what was the criteria in terms of choosing the type and confirmation of Caspian horses at the time? So what was she looking for apart from a small pony or a small horse? And did it gradually change over the next few years of founding the uh, foundation horses? Okay, well, that's actually a really great question because uh, when she, what intrigued her when she first saw the horse uh, was she'd been looking for a pony, but she found a horse. And so she looked, she found an animal that was the size of a pony, but looked like a perfect horse. So that became the breed standard, if you will. And in order to establish the breed, you have to establish the fact that two animals will breed true. So they'll breed the, 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 the offspring of two animals will be from a phenotypical point of view, the same. So they'll look the same. So the foundation horses were all selected on the basis of whether or not they bred true and whether or not they um, 
they uh, filled in the, they filled the, the the phenotypical characteristic of what she considered a miniature horse and then for later on her her initial phenotypical judgment was confirmed by the by not only blood uh, uh, analyses that was done but also bone samples that were done that showed that the Caspian horse had a denser bone than uh, than other similar horses. So if you, for instance, if you compare a Caspian horse to a Taolishi horse in the area, in terms of a bone, they'll have denser bones. So her initial breed standard, which was a slim horse-like creature, no bigger than 110, 120 centimeters, always remained the breed, breed standard to this day. I hope I answered your question, Sioma. Thank you very much. Yes, you did. Very good. Uh, well, we have, I think we have a uh, chance for one more question. Uh, one more question. If there's a question out there, someone would want to uh, either put it in, put it in writing or raise, uh, uh, or raise a hand. Well, I, uh, in that case, I'd just like to say in the end, uh, this was absolutely fascinating. And I, I look forward to going back and rereading, uh, rereading your mother's book, which is, just a just an amazing story um and what she did uh, and, and what she did and for so and for so long and through so much adversity uh whatever whether whether it was whether it was weather or bad land the the part that still uh, stays with me is this uh, um optimistically named Noru's abad <laughs> which was anything but abad <laughs> <laughs> and your mother at one point says um, it was uh, the neighbor used the same his land as a gravel pit. <laughs> and this was probably the best use for that land. Uh, but what they did with it is just amazing. And it's a, it's a, it's a persistence of your, your parents' uh, per persistence and what they did. And uh, not only with the horse, but as, uh, with the Caspian horse, but also with so many, so many other things. So thank you. Thank you again, uh, Tashay, for a wonderful performance, a uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, best of luck with your, with your work. We look forward to hearing more about this thank wonderful you. story. Bahman, would you like to... Uh, Finish yes, off. I'd like to second that statement from Ambassador Limber, Dr. Shea. It was a fantastic lecture. I've learned so much about it. And you just uh, relive the history for us with those beautiful pictures. And Thank you. I want to let everybody know that we're working on a second program about Luis Firuz that includes videos, films, and memories from inside Iran. And we are bringing people from the Caspian Horse Society from inside Iran to join us for another panel discussion to reflect on their experiences with your mom and how much your mom had an impact on what they are doing. So I want to thank everybody who joined us and please stay tuned for our next announcement on this program. I'm sure we will continue working on these um, cases because it's so important to bring it to the attention of people, how much individual Americans have had an impact inside you all.